Dear participants to this lunch webinar, a very warm welcome. As president of the European Law Institute, it is a great pleasure and my privilege to welcome you all to this webinar on ELI report on Ecoside. The Ecoside project has been run by the ELI under one of its three pillars of research, in particular under the one dedicated to sustainable life and society. The project has been approved by the ELI Council on 19 January 23 and by the ELI membership on the 16 February 2023. This means that the project is more than timely to support the reflections of the European Union, but also of other stakeholders in this field of sustainable life and society. The revision of the Directive 2008-99 on protection of the environment through criminal is in entering the phase of a trilogue between the European Parliament, the Council of the European Union and the European Commission. We do hope that this project will contribute significantly to the discussion on this critical matter. It is therefore the aim of today's webinar to address the principal innovations and solutions which have been agreed upon by the ELI Council to do and the membership. To do so, we have with us an incredible panel, but above all, we have the two co-reporters of the projects for the ELI, Professor Fausto Pocar and Robert Bray. Robert Bray worked for the European Parliament from 97 to 2017. His final position was head of unit of the Secretariat of the Legal Affairs Committee. As a lawyer and a linguist, he, is also, he has also worked in private industry and for the Court of Justice of the European Union, the European Economic and Social Committee, and the Bank for International Settlements. And he is a member of the ELI Council since 2017. Professor Fausto Poca is Professor Emeritus of International Law at Milan University and Dr. Honoris Causa at Antwerp and Buenos Aires. He has been an ad hoc judge at the International Court of Justice since 2017, was a member of the UN Human Rights Committee from 84 to 2000, and its president from 91 to 92. He uh, has been a judge at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia from 2019 to 2017, and its president from 2005 to 2008 and appeals judge at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda from 2000 to 2015. He is also a member of the ELI Council and this since 2019. But before handing them the floor, let me remind you that the chat function has been disabled, but you can bring to our attention, to the attention of the panelists, all your questions through the Q&A function that stays also in the function uh, area. Please do not wait until the end to pose your questions, but we will deal with the questions during approximately 20, 25 minutes at the end of the various presentations. Now let's start, and let's start with the two co-reporters of the European Law Institute project on Ecoside. And first you have the floor, uh, Fausto, and then I suppose Robert will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal, for giving me the floor. Um, let me start by saying that um, creating a new crime is not an easy job. Um, the new crime uh, ecocide, as you know, means uh, essentially destruction of the house. The house, our house is the earth. So it means destruction of the, of the earth. Um, and uh, there are many difficulties, of course, in doing that, uh, which are in a way um, particularly uh, delicate when uh, we are dealing with a model directive of the European Union that has to be implemented later on by member states in their national legislation. Uh, mainly, uh, creating a new crime uh, bears two difficulties, two, three difficulties. One is the definition of the conduct that has to be uh, penalized and uh, should be uh, punishable. 
Then uh, there is the subjective element. When is a person responsible for such a conduct? What kind of uh, mens rea, as we say in uh, legal terms, has to be adopted? And the third difficulty is the definition of the penalty. I will not uh, discuss here the, the penalty, but uh, the main issues that uh, uh, came into consideration are the conduct and the subjective elements. As to the conduct, uh, there are two options possible. One is to have a general definition. We are speaking of international crime, so one can uh, adopt uh, a general definition of the crime or adopt a list of specific acts which constitutes uh, the crime. And here we had to make a choice that might have been different if we had worked to establish a crime to be implemented by international tribunals. Because uh, a general definition may be clearly more suitable for an international tribunal because the practice of international courts criminal courts has uh, clarified that the margin of appreciation of the court is uh, relatively wide when you are dealing with an international crime. You can use uh, uh, customary concepts. You, can, you are in an environment, a legal environment that allows for such a margin that uh, we not necessarily find in the domestic uh, system of the states. So uh, the, that explains also why the directive goes uh, in the definition, in the um, definition of specific acts uh, up to now. Um, and we went into that direction because as our view is to, uh, well, our purpose was to adopt a, a definition that might be later implemented easily by member states, we thought it would be better to have a, a specific X definition. But now the problem was making a new list when there is a list of environmental crimes in the directive was not probably a good, a good idea. So the approach was uh, uh, to, um, to uh, refer to the list that already exists or that is will exist when amended later on, but add this uh, new element that when certain uh, elements, certain elements of gravity of the conduct are present, this should be denominated as ecocide. It's not just a question of name, because the names uh, are important in criminal matters, especially as far as prevention is concerned because uh, the stigma in the society is different if you are uh, um, punished for a crime which in the uh, reception by the participants, by the members of the society has a certain connotation and it's much less uh, relevant when you adopt a lower connotation like environmental crime, which is uh, relatively neutral. Um, so the idea was uh, exactly to refer to that, but to say that when there is a certain gravity and we express the gravity, the elements of the gravity in the, uh, in the draft, uh, it has to be denominated as ecocide and has to be punished as ecocide. As to the subjective element, uh, here, too, the issue was essentially to avoid mere negligence as a, a, as a cause for responsibility, because this is not really very much acceptable in criminal law in general. Uh, but uh, um, uh, on the other hand, to uh, consider that a subjective element may be uh, not necessarily the full intent, uh, the general intent uh, as we have uh, in criminal law normally. And we adopted a solution therefore of uh, uh, dolus eventualis, 
of what is called dolus eventualis or aware recklessness. That means uh, that uh, uh, there is a, a certain, uh, um, a certain uh, responsibility, even if uh, uh, not by mere negligence, but uh, a person that should have known, ought to have known that the crime, uh, that certain consequences of his conduct uh, would, uh, would uh, cause damage, uh, should be punished even if the evidence of the full intent is not, uh, is not brought forward. So this is the, essentially the basis of our reflections. Um, let me uh, say also that we uh, followed uh, uh, the need to uh, respect fully the principle of legality, because this is the main issue that uh, we have to take into account when adopting a criminal, a criminal provision. So the law should be certain, it should be, uh, should be clearly perceivable by a potential perpetrator. Uh, I think I have limited time. I stop here and leave uh, the floor to my colleague. Robert, you have the floor. You're still muted, Robert. Yes, I realize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. And thank you, Fausto, for that very clear uh, exposition. Um, the Eli's project has, has finished. But this is not the end of the story. Um, as we know, the European Parliament has adopted a package of compromise amendments, um, which reflect some aspects of ecocide, some aspects of matters which we have dealt with, and some aspects of the proposal which has been put forward for modifying the, the Rome Statute by the group led by Philippe Sanz. Um, this package of amendments will now be negotiated with the Council in what is known as a trilogue. And we feel that um, our report still has a role to play. I still think that our approach to the Actus Reus could afford a solution which could be acceptable both to the European Parliament and to the member states. That is because it is based on the existing directive as it is being amended, and it is therefore systematically compatible with it. It is also future-proof and compatible with innovations brought about at the national le level. I would also submit that our Article 5 on expert evidence could also be a useful addition to the, to the package. In addition, I think that our approach to the mens rea is an extremely intelligent and sensible one. The obviously nobody is going to intend in the strict sense of the word to cause, bring about circumstances, damage of, of amounting to uh, ecocide. It is almost a crime which could be a crime of strict liability, but we rejected that and we came up with dolus eventualis or an aware or subjective recklessness. And I think this is certainly an approach worth taking. Another thing which I think the legislature could take up is our approach to authorizations. Um, our Article 4 was a result of final negotiations with uh, conducted by Christiana Wenderhorst and um, Paul Gilligan and uh, Christian um, uh, 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 um, sorry <laughs> Christian Twig Fletchner. Let's get his name around the wrong way. Um, and because one of the one of the shortcomings of the law on environmental liability, criminal liability, is the possibility that the offender can say, aha, I've got an administrative authorization from such and such a body, 
and this lets me off the hook. And we think that our, there is a, a similar provision in the among the European Parliament's amendments, but we consider that our amendment is much more elaborated and certainly worthy of consideration by the legislature. The last thing, and by least, but certainly not the least, least important, is the fact that we've included in our proposals a proposal for a model European Council directive on the utilization of the European Public Prosecutor's Office to bring proceedings for environmental crime, especially ecocide. One of the problems is that often people who would like to bring a complaint before the authorities have no clear avenue for doing so, especially when they're located outside the European Union. Here we're assuming that the perpetrator, the author of the crime, is in the European Union. Um, and this model proposal would give the possibility for NGOs and environment defenders to initiate proceedings through the European Public Prosecutor's Office. I think that it'd be a wonderful thing if at the end of the negotiations, the European Parliament managed to get the Council to accept this. So we hope our report will continue to contribute to the development of the crime of ecocide, and we will be taking part in various events and publications in order to keep the subject alive. Uh, I would very much like to thank um, the members of the project team and uh, Fausta, who has been my great guide in this. I am not a criminal lawyer. And in particular, I would like to thank Ilaria Pratelli, um, Laura, Laura, Laura Gretscher, Femke Weiderhoff for, for, Weiderkopf for their help, and Christiana Wenderhorst and, and uh, Christian Twigfleschner and Paul Gilligan for their help in the final negotiations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Fausto Boca and uh, Robert Bray for this very important uh, dogmatical framework setting and also political uh, perspective that are at the heart of this project. So uh, thank you very much. And I think we will, without further ado, uh, uh, continue with now a, a kind of legislative update from the parliament perspective. And I will have the pleasure to give the floor to Marie Toussaint. Uh, she's a French uh, jurist in international environmental law, co-founder of the association Notre Affaire à Tous. She was elected member of the European Parliament and joined the Greens and the European Free Alliance Group in May 2019 and sits on the uh, energy industry, environment and legal affairs uh, committees and therefore has all the various perspectives needed to give a, a real in, uh, important uh, perspective here from the side of the parliament. Marie Toussaint, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Pascal, and also thanks for holding the time in a sobriant way. <laughs> um, that's really precious. Um, hello, all. I think that what, what we've heard um, is that, well, we're trying to just, sorry, just. Sorry, we had an echo inside of the office um, that I needed to, to check. So what we're trying to do is to build something new, which is always a challenge and it is quite difficult, right? Um, and when I got into the European Parliament, for me, it was absolutely essential to uh, bring this issue of environmental liability on the table, would it be civil or criminal uh, liability? Because there was somehow, well, I think this is absolutely a turning point uh, for the transition that is needed. Um, but this was also the missing piece of the Green Deal. We didn't have anything that was related to it. So that's why we pushed through the Legal Affairs Committee to have something. We first got an initiative report requiring um, the revision of uh, both directives on civil and criminal uh, liability, environmental criminality. Um, and then we received this proposal from the Commission on the table. What we tried to do at first was to push on three priorities, but also uh, some other smaller ones. Um, the first one was, of course, um, to create and recognize the crime of ecocide in EU law. 
Um, the second one was to ensure an autonomous definition of environmental offenses, um, so including ecocide, of course. And the third one was to extend the competencies of uh, EPO, the European uh, Prosecution Office, um, and also specialized unit and chambers at national level. So this was the three ones around which I managed to gather um, MEPs from different political groups to work together in that direction from different committees. But we also wanted to apply the strongest sanctions, especially for the crime of ecocide, um, more based on the annual turnover of companies than really on, on jail time. Um, no limitation period when it comes to the crime of ecocide. And of course, the universal jurisdiction. And that said, uh, how much this uh, is of importance. Um, so we tabled our amendments, but I have to underline the fact that at the beginning, it was absolutely impossible for these amendments to, to be adopted. We we're living from very, very far, and the console didn't work in that direction. In the EP, we didn't know, but it wasn't really certain, right? So we really needed help. Um, we needed help from civil society, of course. Um, and Jojo Meta and Stop Ecocide were key in that regard. But we also needed to have very strong um, legal opinions, uh, analysis, and uh, support. Uh, and this came from the LA Institute. So I really want to take advantage of this uh, uh, conference also to thank Robert and Fosto for the huge work um, that you have done. Indeed, so far, some of our amendments were not uh, as as good and precise as yours, but it came at the right moment to be able to negotiate also based on your suggestions. So I think that was really good. Um, and it really helped us um, showing that, yes, uh, European lawyers um, are behind and supporting um, this change in the law. And that was absolutely key. So thanks a lot really uh, for that. Where did we get uh, inside of the European Parliament? Um, well, we, um, are quite happy, I have to say. And I think that Foster and Robert showed where it was uh, quite difficult. Um, the first thing I wanna say is that we had an issue, of course, with the wording. Uh, and we still have one. Uh, I'll talk about the console a bit later, but we still have one because ecocide is a strong word. And in some of the countries, this is not acceptable because of political reasons, but in others, it is also not acceptable as a word because of um, history. And I'm thinking especially to Germany, where these kind of terms have a strong uh, meaning. So we have this issue of the word. Um, do we agree on what's behind? And then do we agree on the word itself? Um, how did we try to get around this difficulty? Is that we have, and we're talking about ecocide in the um, considering part, uh, but then we have a separate, um, well, we have a, an operational part um, that is, um, relying to ecocide, but not using uh, inside the word of ecocide, although using uh, the description from both the panel and the LA Institute are um, quite quite same, um, actually. We, of course, wanted to have a special article on ecocide. That's what we tried to push for at the start. We didn't manage to have that. And um, I think for the very reasons that uh, Robert underlined, we had to somehow have the list indeed, and Posto talked about this list. Um, we need to have this list, then have a catch up clause, um, catch all clause, sorry, that is saying um, when you have an environmental damage and none of the above, none of the lists are uh, considered as directly um, violated, then you need to look at the consequences. Um, do we see consequences and do we see, uh, of course, the uh, causal link um, that is behind? And then if we have, with, of course, a lot of precisions on um, what's behind the definition, previsibility, predictability, and all of this, but when you have that, then you still need to have a criminal sanction that is applied. And once we have this catch-all clause, then we say, among which the gravest of the crimes should be considered as such, so we have here the definition um, of the panel and, and Eli, and then we say, and also to get around uh, what could be uh, blocking in the council, then we say um, the sanctions um, that will be applied. We didn't discuss on the sanctions right away in the parliament. It would have been too difficult, but also for the council, what we tell the member states is basically, you all have in your penal codes, in your criminal codes, you all have sanctions, really high sanctions for the gravest crimes. 
those that are punished under the Roma statute, right? So ecocide needs to be sanctioned according to what you already have in all of your um, criminal codes, um, because we are talking about the gravest of, of all crimes. Then, so we, we do have um, this ecocide crime. Um, it must be uh, sanctioned as uh, some of the gravest crimes. We do have the autonomous offenses and ecocide must be understood as um, an autonomous offenses, but which could of course also relate to the violation of um, the pre uh, put it directive. What I want to insist on maybe uh, before uh, finishing and getting to uh, what we'll do with the Council um, is how we improved the definition of unlawful compared to what the Commission put on the table. This was the subject of a lot of discussions among the um, MEPs um, and what we did was to uh, di di displace a bit um, how unlawful was uh, defined until now by changing the wording from union legislation to union law, which is a bit broader and encompasses as well primary laws. So the treaties, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, etc., international treaties, for instance, but also the general principles of EU law as established in case laws and secondary law and delegated and implementing act. So this is the core uh, group and um, well, unlawful means uh, violating any of all of those uh, union law acts. Um, then we specified the fact that the conduct shall also be considered unlawful when it breaches a condition of authorization. What we meant by that is that um, you cannot hide, hide behind the fact that you have an authorization if it is obvious that you acted recklessly. Um, so that's what we tried to, to do. Um, just regarding April and the European Prosecution Office, we didn't manage to directly um, give the environmental competence to April, but we're trying to, and we ask the Commission to come back with a proposal uh, in that direction. That's the most that we could have done um, at that moment. Um, but of course, we still need to can convince um, the member states on all of those, knowing that we also lacked um, some um, ambitious proposals that we had, and we had to make a compromise on the article on ecocide on the limitation period. Uh, finally, we don't have one. Well, it's 10 years. Um, on the uh, exact sanctions on ecocide, then universal jurisdiction for the Allied project is way more ambitious, but we couldn't go further here. Um, so, yeah, but we still need to convince the Council. The first trilogue is on the 4th of May. It's a bit the trilogue where we sit and we just say, here is my position. And we try to understand each other. So this is not the most important one, but the second trilogue will be on the 13th, 20, uh, 13th of June. Um, and then this will be the real work uh, beginning. We're under the Swedish presidency, um, which was a state that was quite advanced on environmental criminality, at least wanting to go further. Um, now the government has changed, so we don't really understand yet what's going to be their position. But after we have the Spanish presidency, which um, um, might be uh, quite helpful uh, in what we're trying to achieve. Um, so this is good. We have, of course, an ally, which is Belgium, who is already working on uh, inserting uh, ecocide in their own uh, national uh, criminal code. Uh, behind, we try to have uh, Luxembourg, Portugal, of course, we have a lot of grand ministers, so we're trying to convince them as well to come and really help us. Uh, but uh, this is going to be um, quite a challenge to convince at least 14 member states. We need 14 to agree with us on our analysis and proposals. And in that regard, any help will be welcome, of course, from the LA Institute, but also with the Commission and especially people like the Dr. Gap. So thanks a lot for that. Thank you very much for this very open and accurate presentation, also of the state of the affairs, so to say, and, and all the efforts that have been put into, into, into this. And I'm sure that uh, this webinar is also here to try to bring the various uh, positions together and maybe uh, join forces, if I may say so, uh, uh, into the right direction. Uh, thank you very much, Marie Toussaint, for, for these words. And I, ha I know that you will have to leave for other uh, meetings, so uh, feel free when you need to go to, to go. I have now the pleasure to uh, uh, give uh, the
the floor to Peter Shonka from uh, the commission and give the legislative update from the side of the commission. Uh, Peter Shonka is a specialist uh, in international European criminal law. Uh, he started his career as a prosecutor before joining the Council of Europe and later the international, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. He works uh, for the European Commission as the head of general criminal law in the DG uh, Justice. And his, I could say his main achievements uh, in include setting up the European Public Prosecutor's Office, which was al already mentioned a couple of times uh, this afternoon. And uh, he's also a professor, a visiting professor at the European Institute, uh, Europe Institute in Saarbrücken and also lectures at the University of Luxembourg. And now uh, he will give us these legislative updates from the uh, commission feedback also on the ELI report. Uh, Peter Schonka, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, and thank you very much uh, uh, to the organizers for the invitation uh, to this uh, webinar. And thank you very much to Eli uh, for the report. Um, in in uh, that order, all these things are important. Uh, and uh, indeed, this is something very topical uh, on which discussions continue. Uh, uh, and uh, as uh, Marie and others have uh, reminded us, uh, the legislative agenda is now laid ahead of us. Uh, we have a general approach uh, on the uh, directive uh, from the Council from December last year. We have the mandate of the Parliament uh, from March this year, uh, and we will start the trilogues uh, on the 4th of May. Uh, and it's clear that uh, uh, nobody has echo uh, in their mandate specifically uh, as a standalone crime, uh, but we are getting close to it uh, in uh, some respect uh, in the text. Uh, now, um, just a quick reminder of uh, where we come from. Uh, the Commission uh, uh, has uh, made a proposal to uh, revise the 2008 uh, directive, uh, which in our view uh, was not sufficiently effective uh, and uh, it did not contain sufficient uh, uh, sanction types and levels uh, for various reasons. So uh, we had uh, essentially uh, six objectives uh, with the revision. Number one uh, was to uh, increase the number of offenses uh, to align uh, the criminal law uh, provisions on uh, the evolution of environmental law in the EU. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something that has gone on uh, indeed in the last uh, uh, 15 years since the directive. Uh, and we needed to do this alignment. Uh, and we wanted better definitions of environmental criminal offenses um, in the directive. Uh, number two, we wanted to introduce minimum maximum sanctions uh, for both legal and natural persons, uh, as well as aggravating circumstances and accessory sanctions. And you have them indeed in the uh, directive. And then we uh, wanted to increase fines for legal persons. Uh, uh, and we proposed uh, a quite revolutionary idea, which is uh, imported uh, from the area of data protection and the competition law, which is to use the worldwide turnover of companies for calculating those fines uh, uh, to be used upon uh, uh, legal persons. And then uh, we wanted to increase cooperation between member states authorities uh, and uh, in the so-called law enforcement chain. Uh, we wanted better investigation tools for law enforcement authorities. Uh, and we wanted statistical data uh, to be collected by member states uh, and to be transmitted to the commission to see how actually this evolves in practice uh, in the member states. So all this is now in the uh, general approach of the council, but we still indeed uh, need uh, a final agreement interinstitutionally uh, between Council, Parliament and the Commission. Uh, as you know, we sit in the middle uh, and we act uh, as a uh, bona fide uh, negotiator to help uh, the institutions reach uh, an agreement. Uh, and we see a few points um, that will come up. Number one will be sanctions. Uh, uh, member states are reluctant uh, to change uh, their uh, uh, classical criminal, criminal uh, statutes. Uh, and to increase penalties uh, for one uh, offense or for the other. Uh, and I see uh, uh, a few law professors uh, online, uh, they will know that uh, uh, consistency of criminal law is absolutely essential uh, for member states. Uh, so uh, taking out one definition and increasing the penalty level is very hard for member states to accept. Uh, it will be also hard uh, for everybody uh, to change the method of calculation uh, for the fines uh, for legal persons. Uh, we are grateful to the parliament uh, for 
uh, accepting uh, this new calculation method, they have even increased the percentage uh, from five to 10%, uh, which is uh, something really uh, to be welcomed. Then for imprisonment, uh, natural persons, again, uh, we expect uh, the maximum, uh, minimum maximum levels to uh, uh, rise uh, with the uh, proposal uh, and we count on the support of council and parliament for this. Uh, and I think we're getting there. Uh, uh, then an issue that we will certainly uh, want to see is uh, introduction of uh, aggravating circumstances, uh, uh, including uh, obligations uh, um, uh, for, for uh, offenders to reinstate the environment uh, uh, when they are involved uh, uh, in committing these offenses, uh, and we count on the parliament to help with that. Uh, uh, we see convergence on the unlawful permits. Uh, uh, we have agreed uh, on the definition of unlawfulness with the council after much discussion, uh, and uh, we welcome the uh, proposals of the parliament uh, in this regard. And it's clear that unlawful permits uh, should not be used uh, for uh, activities. Uh, the offenders uh, should face a prosecution if they use unlawful permits. And I will come back to that point in a second. Uh, one point on which we will see uh, discussions needed is specialization uh, of uh, the authorities. Uh, investigation, prosecution, and courts. Uh, uh, some member states have set up specialized courts or chambers, uh, uh, but fully specialized judicial branches for environmental crime, I think will be hard, uh, but we count on the parliament support uh, for the general idea of specialization. Uh, this is really a game changer. Uh, and those member states that have introduced uh, units in the police, in prosecution to deal with environmental crime uh, have uh, seen uh, substantial change in, in the number of prosecutions and effective uh, judgments. Now on the EPPO, just one point, uh, I'm watching the clock. Uh, uh, you know that this is going to be very hard. Uh, uh, we need unanimity in the European Council. 27 member states, heads of state need to agree uh, uh, to amend the treaty, Article 86, uh, and then uh, we will need to amend uh, the, uh, the EPPO regulation by unanimity. Uh, for now, our focus is to make the EPPO work uh, on its current competence, which is EU fraud. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, we are happy to uh, look at uh, the competence issue in the future, and we will produce a report uh, by July this year, uh, uh, following which uh, uh, we are open to discuss uh, the uh, extension of the EPPO's competence to any serious crime. Now, one word on the Eli uh, report, uh, uh, which in my view goes in the right direction uh, because uh, it picks up on the uh, international debate. Uh, and I'm very glad uh, to speak uh, with all the distinguished speakers uh, who have been spearheading this debate uh, uh, for years now, uh, including uh, Jojo uh, and Marie. Uh, this is an important debate. Uh, uh, the main problem we have seen from the beginning is the uh, definition of ecocide uh, as something focusing on the damage. Uh, we have to have uh, the definition right, uh, and that definition must be based uh, on uh, specific uh, actus reus. So acts, uh, human behavior need to be described in a specific way. Uh, and we see that the report actually mentioned this. Uh, um, uh, there is language that says uh, we should define, we should identify some typical behaviors, uh, just as in the case in other crimes. Uh, whereas this is not done in the uh, legal proposal. Uh, so we think uh, that, uh, that there needs to be uh, some further work uh, on the definition of uh, the actus reus uh, in, the, in, in the legal proposal. Uh, and uh, we fully support the report when it goes into, into uh, unlawful uh, definition, unlawful uh, authorizations, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, also the, uh, the uh, uh, structure that is kept vis-a-vis uh, -vis administrative environmental law. Uh, uh, we uh, applaud this effort. Uh, we really think this is, is really necessary. Uh, uh, and uh, we may not get there in the, in the Environmental Crime Directive. Uh, I see res resistance coming from uh, the member states, but I'm sure this debate is very useful uh, for us uh, to uh, come back to this issue in the next round. Uh, and uh, for this, uh, we very much appreciate the report uh, that came from uh, uh, Eli. So thank you very much for this. Uh, I hope I remain in the time. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, especially because you, you did in such a limited time a wonderful uh, presentation of uh, what is at stake and what we'll be discussing the couple of uh, uh, next months. Uh,
not uh, withstanding uh, the aims and, and what remains, uh, you know, uh, important but might not be uh, achieved immediately. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I have now the pleasure uh, to give the floor to uh, Jojo Meta. She co-founded Stop Ecoside in 2017 alongside the late Polly Higgins to support the establishment of Ecoside as a crime at the International Criminal Court. And as the executive director of Stop Ecoside International, she has overseen really the growth of the movement whilst coordinating between legal developments, diplo diplomatic tra attractions and uh, public narrative. She is also the chair of uh, Stop Ecoside Foundation and uh, governor of the independent expert panel for the legal definition of ecocide, chaired by Philip Sands QC and Dyer Falso. And of course, she will give us now a perspective or, or, uh, on the uh, ecocide law in general and the uh, progress that have been made. I look really forward to listen to you. You have the floor, Jojo Meta. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, and good day to everyone. And first and foremost, of course, I would like to congratulate ELI on such a comprehensive report which beyond the model rules themselves makes a brilliant case for the importance of legislating for ecocide in the first place. And we have found at Stop Ecoside International that this is key to political understanding and support. And our work is in this area. It's advocacy in the very broadest sense in that what we concretely do is cultivate an organic global web of relationships and expertise. We nurture and galvanize cross-sector collaborations and convene on the topic of ecocide law in political, legal, and diplomatic contexts. However, our advocacy is also highly specific in that what we foster in all of those networks is in all of those countries is, is quite simply this support for recognition of ecocide as an international crime. Now, of course, we're by no means the only people working in this space. And I would, of course, like to warmly acknowledge the extraordinary work done by MEP Marie Toussaint's team and, of course, ELI, as I mentioned at the start. But you could perhaps think of us as the advocacy engine, <laughs> perhaps, of the rapidly growing movement to criminalize mass harm to nature. And we sit somewhere in between the three aspects that you mentioned, um, Pascal. So firstly, the legal developments. Our foundation convened the Independent Expert Panel, or the IEP for short, co-chaired by Philippe Sands and Diofal So. And one of our legal associates was also on the ELI drafting team. Uh, we're also aware of the inspiration provided by our co-founder, my dear friend and colleague, the late Polly Higgins, in both of those groups. Secondly, of course, the diplomatic traction. We have been working closely with the Pacific Ocean state of Vanuatu, since before the birth of our public campaign in 2017, and we continue to work in partnership with Vanuatu and others, such as Belgium and Bangladesh, to convene diplomatic roundtables and to co-lead UN events on the subject and gather interest and support at the diplomatic level. And thirdly, importantly, the public narrative, which is about keeping track of and publicizing, of course, global developments on ecocide law and fostering special interest networks of support, youth, faith, farming, oceans, music, many more. And nurturing, of course, this conversation, notably without engaging in partisan politics or in finger pointing, which is all very important for mainstreaming the ecocide conversation. And over the years of this collaborative and, and very focused advocacy, we've noticed that there are key potential benefits to recognition of ecocide, which have emerged as particularly compelling. Firstly, recognizing ecocide as a serious crime will shore up, strongly reinforce and support the useful development of the existing body of law to protect the environment. We've been told directly by agricultural companies that they don't always bother to fulfill environmental regulations because it's cheaper not to and nobody's checking. Imagine the way a board of directors would approach its regulatory obligations knowing that if it failed to fulfill them and threatened the ecocide as a result, its members could be in criminal law territory. This would be a huge step for accountability and could change decision-making in a very positive way. Secondly, having a definition for ecocide creates a useful lens for anyone that knows their sector to address strategic positive change that goes a bit deeper than say, using paper straws or electric vehicles in your company fleet. And this is an extremely important point, which means the power of ecocide law kicks in long before adoption of the law itself. And as the UN Climate Champions Pivot Point report last year pointed out, recognition of ecocide is already perceived as a driver and influencer of change. After all, the aim is ultimately, as with all criminal law, not about the prosecutions, it's about changing behavior. It's especially good for lawyers and politicians to bear this in mind. 
And the emergence of the independent expert panel's definition in June 2021 was a key milestone. And within a year from its launch, it became the, the de facto starting point for diplomatic, political, academic, and legal discussions of ecocide around the world, including for the ELI project and for the amendments recently proposed by the EU Parliament. And it's worth noticing how far this conversation has actually come in a few short years. Ecocide was really, a, one might say, a dormant topic at the diplomatic level before the Pacific Ocean state of Vanuatu, as our long term ally, as I mentioned, um, they called in 2019 for the International Criminal Court's Assembly of States Parties to consider adding ecocide to the Rome Statute. Now, at least 27 state parties to that statute now have discussion of ecocide law on public record at parliament and or government level. The Council of Europe has recommended all its 46 member states to legislate for ecocide and has begun work on a convention that will include it. And as you all know, of course, the EU Parliament has just proposed its inclusion into EU law. This is not only climate vulnerable states which are taking an interest, but also the victims of conflict damage. Ukraine representatives were instrumental in driving developments at the Council of Europe. Indeed, the topics of conflict on the one hand and climate and ecological crisis on the other cross at exactly the point where ecocide law should and we believe will eventually sit. To return to the ELI report, while inspired by the IEP definition as a springboard, so to speak, the report evolves a definition and recommendations that are specific to the EU, as we've heard, and this in itself is a hugely useful and timely contribution to the global conversation. Indeed, one of the most common queries leveled at the IEP's definition has been, you know, but how will this fit into our national law? How will this fit into European law? And the ELI report focuses on core criteria around which member states can legislate according to what fits best into their own penal codes, which is a politically practical approach and we believe could be well uh, welcomed by EU member states. And while avoiding the additional threshold of wanton acts, which is used by the IEP, the ELI broadens the scope of the unlawful, unlawful aspect by highlighting the, administ the administrative authorizations and permits gained through fraud and corruption cannot be considered lawful. And this is something that Peter Kant has just brought up as well. We also believe that the clear setting out of intention for the act and knowledge of likely consequences is also hugely useful and deeply appropriate with regard to the mens rea and Robert Bray has highlighted the reasons for that. We also feel it entirely appropriate that the report suggests that the European Public Prosecutor's Office should be able to investigate and prosecute either side and provides a model decision to enable this, placing the understanding of the nature of this crime squarely in the arena of international or cross-border crimes. And while there are many who would love to see Ecocide as a silver bullet to address all environmental harms, we believe that, of course, its true value is in addressing and naming the worst harms, thereby creating a moral and legal underpinning and fulfilling a kind of foundational dual function of support for existing laws, and in a future-proof way, as, as was described earlier, and influence on cultural norms. And this is hugely important. And the ELI report does seem strongly aligned with this approach. And we note that the draft text proposed by the EU's Legal Affairs Committee and approved last month by the EU Parliament does, however, include the term widespread, which is avoided in the ELI report. And while I know this was carefully considered, I do feel that the definition loses something as a result. And I'm glad to note that the EU draft text has retained this term. And I'm particularly led to note this in the context in which I find myself this morning. And for me, it's just 20 past eight. I'm in Brazil, where indigenous leaders from all over the country are gathered in the capital celebrating their historic election to parliament and inclusion in government. For them, ecocide has in practice amounted to the destruction of their way of life and often of their very lives. And the IEP's definition of widespread includes severe damage to cultural resources resulting from environmental harm. And this is important and also not irrelevant to the EU, firstly with reference to activities affecting the Euro Europe's indigenous, the Samai people, but also with reference to the supply chains of goods procured from the Amazon and other regions. Now, I think my time is up. So to conclude, I would like to highlight that what we're seeing is a strong direction of travel in terms of public concern and support, as well as political. And this is continuing to grow rapidly. It is felt to be a uniquely appropriate and concrete response to multiple global crises and set perhaps in contrast to multilateral environmental agreements that are not binding. I would once more acknowledge the fundamental importance of the work of Professor Pocar, Robert Bray and the ELI project team. And we'll trust that this excellent report will prove a key tool in implementing this legislative initiative in the European and indeed the wider global context. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jojo Meta. Uh, thank you very much, Jojo, for this, uh, uh, well, inspiring also uh, presentation and, and uh, this aim at uh, changing behavior. And changing behavior can also come from, uh, you know, enforcement, uh, enforcing rules, trying to find the right way in front of courts. And that's why we thought it might be interesting to have also uh, someone who, um, who does that in, in uh, almost everyday life. And, and this is why, uh, as a last member of this panel, we have asked uh, uh, Arnaud nussbaumer Lagazawi, Professor Arnaud nussbaumer Lagazawi. He's a professor of contract and, and tours at Unidistance in Switzerland. He teaches private law, but he is also an attorney. And um, apart from his PhD and LLM uh, at Yale Law School, etc. He is a founding member of Avocat pour le Climat, so Attorneys for Climate, an association of more than 200 members right now based in Geneva that main purpose is to commence climate change litigations with authorities and therefore, of course, also to deal with this central aspect of ecocide. And therefore, I'm thrilled to hear what uh, he has to say. Arnaud, you have the floor. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you for um, European Law Institute for this remarkable work. Um, and I would take the, the opportunity I was given by Eli to, to share some thoughts I had when I, I read the report, when I read the model rules. Um, I have three points, actually. The first one is on the, the very definition of what is an ecocide, what is addressed by ecocide prosecution. Um, as, as Pascal mentioned, I'm very, and the association we founded uh, is very interested in climate related litigations and, and more specifically against um, government or corporations. And in that respect, when I read the, um, when I read the report, I, I thought that maybe I, I would need some clarification. Um, uh, and, and I assume that the, the clarification needed um, are the results from some compromises that have, that have been um, mentioned before. Um, and I think what is, what is striking here for me, at least, is this difference between environmental protection and climate protection. When you, you, you think of protection of environment, you, you think of protection of lakes, of water courses, of soils, of biotopes, of fauna or, or, and, and flora, etc. And when you, you think about protection of climate, it's more protection against an over concentration of uh, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So uh, protection against uh, the global warming. Um, and often climate protection is included in the, the environment protection. And here, when you look at the report, when you look at the model rules, um, the two aspects uh, are addressed. When you look at the whereas, the, the, um, the, the future of mass extinction, the declining health and climate disruption uh, are mentioned, which reveals the, the, the intent to, to, to address both um, environment problem and climate problem. When you look at the, the report, the Eli report, uh, I had the same feeling because the, the report says that the idea of ecocide is to addressing threat on oceans, water courses, atmosphere, and climate. With that in mind, when you look at the definition of ecocide in Article 3 of the model rule, it, it says that ecocide means any conduct with make cause or substantially contrib contribute to causing severe and long-term damage to an ecosystem. And what is an ecosystem? It's a significant geographic area where plants, animals, and organisms, as well as we weather and landscape, work together. So when I read that, it, it appeared to me that um, ecocide is more focused on environment damages than climate related um, damages. And with that in mind, I was wondering, with such definition, would it be possible to commence criminal um, cases against carbon ma majors like Chevron, Shell, BP, Exxon? And, and I think with the definition we can see here of what is an ecocide, I think it, it would be very, um, very difficult. And maybe that's, that's the, the very idea of ecocide. Maybe that's the, the result of a compromise. I, I, I don't know. But maybe there should be here something to clarify because in some respect, we, we can see that there is an intent to tackle climate change. 
But when you look at the directive, directive that is now contemplated, it doesn't seem totally, completely well suited for tackling, tackling climate change related problems. That was my first point. Um, my second point is, is um, related to the liability on legal person. And I found it very interesting in Article 8 um, of the Mother Rule uh, that's, that reads, member states shall ensure that legal persons can be held liable for the offense of ecocide where such often, offense sorry, has been committed for, for their benefit. And this last, these last words, for their benefits, I think it's very interesting because as, as a lawyer, um, I mean, if I wanted to file a suit against um, a corporation that committed ecocide, I think a very easy, very easy way of defense from, from respondent would be to say, well, maybe we have committed uh, severe damages on ecosystems, but it was not directly for our benefits. So, I mean, we can escape liability this, in, this, in, this, in this respect. And maybe again, it's the result of a compromise, but I think that maybe some clarification could be very beneficial um, uh, on, on that aspect. And the, the third point, um, it's the participation um, of, uh, of, of NGOs. And I think it's of paramount importance. We, 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 we experience that um, as an association, Avocat pour le climat, Attorneys for Climate. We, we observe that, for instance, in Switzerland, we already have um, criminal offenses related to the protection on environment, but those criminal offenses are not enforced by prosecutors, uh, even though we have laws and protection on waters, soils, natures, etc. Those laws, in terms of criminal prosecution, prosecution are barely uh, apply, applied. And why is that? Because I mean, no one has a personal interest to trigger um, the prosecution, um, and and allowing NGOs to commence. Uh, to commence some uh, prosecution to to trigger the prosecution process with respect to ecocide would be um, a huge improvement in terms of protection of nature um, and uh, and the environment. With just something, I think it's not um, allowing NGOs to commence criminal prosecution or uh, participate to criminal prosecution is not a magic solution um, because what we can see. If you compare to how genocide or crime against humanity are handled by national prosecutors, most of the time, even though NGOs are involved, they are not very enthusiastic when, when, when dealing with that kind of crimes. Um, and I think what we need in order to tackle ecocide is very motivated prosecutor who really wanted to really want to liaise with administrative authorities in order to identify who and where ecocide uh, were committed. So um, I think, and I will end with that, I think allowing NGOs to participate to criminal proceedings is a huge step forward, I think, uh, but a, a gigantic step forward would be to, to have motivated prosecutor very interested in environment protection. Thank you. Thank you for, um, for your attention. And, Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for this very engaged and, and uh, uh, thoughtful uh, analysis. And that might lead me directly to the q and I saw that during the uh, discussion, there were a kind of subtext discussion in the q and because some of the panelists already answered in writing to some of the questions. But I will be happy to, uh, to take also some of these points uh, again in the uh, discussion so that everyone can also benefit from it. Uh, and and one, one thing um, struck me when listening to the various interventions, uh, it's this uh, balance between, on the one hand, being able to very precisely define the subject matter and the actus reus, uh, uh, as was also mentioned in the last uh, aspect, what is dealt with with climate uh, crimes or, or ecocide, what is uh, dealt with with environmental uh, crimes, is ecocide more on one or the other or both? And that might have consequences on the uh, proceedings 
and on the type of uh, prosecutions. And this is already not easy, but it might be more difficult because for the EU at least, we face the difficulty of transposition into a member state's law and therefore getting into another level of prosecution by definition, I wanted to say, and of course, a risk of uh, interpretation and, and application at least because the interpretation would be at the EU level, but application on different cases that might diverge again and again. So um, uh, how to harmonize that? I, I saw a lot of questions about uh, the uh, European uh, Prosecutor uh, Office and that things should be changed. And, and maybe uh, I, I would ask uh, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Josef Schonka, why would that not be a good idea or the excellent idea? Is it just because one has to change uh, the various, uh, you know, the treaty and, and some provisions? Or, or, or is it also for other reasons that maybe that's uh, difficult to implement? Thank you very much, Pascal. Well, actually, rather the contrary, it's a very good idea, but it's very difficult to implement, indeed. <laughs> Uh, the, the point is, uh, the EPPO is a recent creation, uh, a recent creature even of the Union's institutional landscape. Uh, it took us years to set it up uh, and to agree uh, with member states about its uh, rather narrow competence. Uh, and as you know, the Union works uh, on the principle of conferral, uh, so member states needed to confer uh, a tiny bit of national sovereignty uh, uh, for giving up that jurisdiction uh, about uh, EU fraud. Uh, and that was recognized uh, as uh, uh, a shared legal um, value uh, that everybody uh, had to protect. Uh, it's in the treaty, Article 325. Uh, uh, so uh, by now, this is accepted uh, that uh, there is a union body that deals with the EU fraud. Uh, the environment is a bit different. It is a shared value as well. Uh, and the report uh, really uh, stresses this point uh, nicely uh, that uh, we all have a responsibility. Uh, private sector, citizens, governments, uh, the military, everybody. Uh, we should protect the environment. Uh, so it's for all of us. Uh, but to give this competence to the EPPO uh, uh, would take uh, a number of legal hurdles uh, and uh, would possibly uh, need a substantial change in the way the EPPO works. Uh, uh, financial crime is different than environmental crime. Uh, fraud is uh, something uh, documentary. Uh, you need to look at... Uh, uh, reports and then you decide whether there is a fraud or there, there isn't. Um, environmental crime requires knowledge of environmental law. And if you look at the environmental crime directive, uh, it refers to dozens of environmental regulatory standards uh, coming from EU law. Uh, and in the 2008 version, uh, there was an annex uh, with 90 different uh, uh, legal acts listed. Uh, and probably uh, by now it would be 300. Uh, so the EPP would have to uh, uh, accumulate knowledge about all this uh, background information, environmental law, before it is able to prosecute these offenses. Uh, that's why I think it's going to be hard, uh, but it's a very good idea. Uh, uh, specialization in itself is a very good idea. Uh, and that's what is uh, in the directive as well. It's an obligation for member states uh, to push for setting up uh, uh, units uh, uh, in the police prosecution in courts uh, to deal with this crime because it will help them understand better this type of criminality. Uh, um, but ultimately, this will be a decision for uh, our member states, for our heads of state, uh, uh, and they are having their minds on something different uh, for now, not environmental crime. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for this very clear statement. And, uh, and of course, uh, since uh, ecocide is often a transnational, so maybe uh, there might be other ways to deal with this transnational issue that was raised also by Arnaud Nussbaum and Lagazawi. And, and maybe Giorgio, uh, Giorgio Meta, you, you want to uh, answer or to react to Arnaud's points, because I, I think uh, I saw you uh, uh, moving <laughs> when he was speaking. So we, we might be interested to see what you have to say. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I, I'm absolutely um, you know, aware of things he's highlighting in terms of the um, the fact that even existing environmental legislation is often unenforced or difficult to enforce and so on. And this obviously also ties in with what Peter was just saying, you know, about how, how actually um, improving the specialization, you know, the investigation, the reporting and all of that 
is, is difficult, but it's a good idea. I mean, I would say that that's that's sort of an understatement in, in the sense that you know what we're facing here is is a, is, is a very deeply deeply embedded cultural separation of human life from the fact that we're you know a part of the, the 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 world around us so i mean we would never even dream of going to a government and saying can i have um a license to kill 500 people for my new infrastructure project i mean it literally wouldn't even cross our minds you know and 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 you know in the same way you know we we all we can sort of universally condemn the you know the destruction of people because that is deeply embedded that human harm is a value you know it, it is it touches on our core values and we don't we just don't have that same reaction to the um the, the destruction of the natural world even though what we're now facing of course is as a bit of a reality check that you know where sort of hundreds of years of this attitude has led us to a, a sort of point where we're now kind of becoming very aware that one cannot extract infinitely from a finite planet and all of all of this sort of thing so it, weirdly it may seem strange but my, one of the answers i think to arno's conundrum is actually ecocide law itself, because the very fact that we are talking about legislating for the worst crimes and acknowledging that at their worst, they are as bad in terms of their long term consequences as genocide, as crimes against humanity, that in itself will help hugely in actually driving the direction of, you know, improving uh, investigation, improving prosecution and, and all of those things. Um, because and, and of course those you know practical considerations. I mean, you know, an environmental crime compared to a fraud, for example, might not just involve the knowledge of uh, environmental laws. It will also potentially involve scientific research. It will potentially involve you know knowledge that comes from other domains. It can be complex, but it's not. So you know, obviously, we don't want to sit there and say, well, this might be a bit difficult, so we probably shouldn't do it. You know, when we're actually looking at an existential threat to you know human civilization as a whole. So, you know, we also have to kind of remember that there is a perspective here. And I think the other thing that's important in this context, and I'll try and be brief, is that, you know, yes, the uh, the, the the sort of big carbon majors and so on, uh, it's, you know, it's very tempting to kind of give a short list of, you know, potential CEOs that one would want to sort of see in the dock. Um, and a few years ago, I, I might well have been happy to do that. But what I really come to realize is that, you know, this is a cultural phenomenon that has gone on for a very, very long time, and we're simply seeing the logical conclusion of it. So what is what has been so inspiring about um, communicating in so many different areas around the ecocide law is the fact that, you know, and, and of course, like we've been using the international uh, uh, panel's definition, but, you know, it, it, that the, the sort of conciseness of that seems to give people this sort of framework or a window, if you like, where they're looking through it and they're sort of thinking, oh, well, if this is potentially coming in in three to four years or whatever, what are the considerations we need to be thinking about now in terms of, you know, steering things in a, in a more positive direction? So I, I suppose, my, you know, my overall point is that, you know, the, the phenomenon of the approach of ecocide law in itself goes a long way towards helping some of these issues that have been raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, this is also the link between climate justice and ecocide and, and the various liability issues. Now, if I go back to ecocide as such, of course, there's the whole discussion about how concrete and how precise actus reus has to be defined. And there's a, a very good question by Ilaria Pretelli for, for Fausto Bocar. Uh, 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 linked to this uh, definition of actus reus and how to do it. And, and she says, could this be put in relation with the observation that we live in times where we assist to a very dangerous decline of politics in favor of technocracy and, and therefore stress more the our common home, our oikos as a, a fundable aspect so that uh, we would go more in favor of uh, result-oriented rules than more uh, technocratic rules. That's Ilaria Spratelli's questions. And, and I'm happy to give the floor to uh, Fausto. He, if he wants to answer that question, he might also uh, decide to give it to someone else. But you're, you're, you're muted, uh, Fausto, sorry. <clears throat> yes. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you to all the speakers for all uh, their comments they have made about the, the project, actually. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, it's not that the project was a matter of compromise, but uh, uh, was an idea that uh, maybe even outside a compromise, when you work in a team, 
is a question of uh, seeing or getting what is the position of everybody and then trying to uh, to find a common uh, a common position actually because we don't know to vote in a, in a group of course and um, uh, the uh, and that's extremely more than a compromise i speak because of the question of the climate uh, has been said maybe it was a uh, was a compromise that was reached uh, on the text but um, in fact uh, uh, it may look at the compromise, but uh, it's a question of interpretation later. And uh, uh, maybe putting uh, at the end of the of the sentence uh, after ecosystem in the natural environment might uh, lead to a, a restrictive interpretation. But in fact, in my view, it does not necessarily because uh, everything goes nevertheless to the natural environment uh, anyhow i mean the climate is a question also the natural environment we want what we wanted to essentially to to say is to not to take a too much uh, um, human centered perceptive uh, perception the idea is putting the accent on the climate more on the damage to the environment more than on the uh, following damage on human beings, because uh, this is also an approach that uh, uh, is uh, is common in many cases. We can take care of the environment as far as there are damages to human beings. The problem is the whole ecosystem that is uh, into consideration comes into consideration, and uh, I think uh, that uh, the 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 climate uh, uh, is not by mere chance that we speak uh, in the mens rea of the question of the consequences. The consequences is anything that may affect an ecosystem. And of course, if uh, the action goes to directly to the climate, then the ecosystem is affected. So at the, in the, long, uh, at the end of the consequences, there is also uh, the climate is certainly included, actually. But of course, it's a question to be to be precise, which, uh, as I said at the beginning, in a <clears throat> in international in a, before an international court would not be so necessary, because international courts normally are used to uh, a progressive interpretation, actually but uh, which is allowed by the law because one of the sources of the law is the customary law and you also in the interpret a treaty you take into account the customary law in a legal system um, in, it depends on the system some system allow for judicial uh, margin of interpretation uh, others do not and so uh, the problem is in european union you have essentially continental systems that frequently do not allow the, this uh, interpretation, this different interpretation. As to the question of Ilaria, is a question of, uh, uh, I don't want to go into the very general general question, of course, uh, on, the, on this matter. I don't want to, to uh, judge if what is better to remain in politics or use technocrats or, or not. Uh, I think they go hand in hand, in, actually, because it's very difficult to deal with politics if you have a, also a technocrat, a technical approach uh, on many issues. And this is a matter, the environment is a matter that requires the, uh, the technical, not only the scientific, but the technical approach, because it's a very difficult matter to, to deal with. So I'm not sure what I could answer to that question. Uh, certainly, there is not enough uh, uh, enough uh, conscience, uh, I would say, of the of the problem. And uh, there is a question in the beginning that uh, has been posed uh, that uh, the speaker Carolina Sanchez says uh, asks uh, this may be the very a very simple question. What is the difference between environmental liability and environmental accountability? Now, I'm not, a, a, of course, a, a native English speaker. So these are two words, liability and accountability, 
they have a specific uh, sense. But as a lawyer, what I can say when you speak of environmental liability is a very technical term. Liability is a responsibility, clear responsibility. I mean, and if it's criminal, it's criminal responsibility. If it's civil, it's civil responsibility. When you speak of accountability, it's a different matter in a way. Is a, a notion which is much more general and uh, is a question that uh, it means uh, essentially it's not a question of liability, you know, responsibility of in, in, in referring to the consequences of the act, but is who did what. That's, that's a very important issue on accountability. Being accountable means yeah, it's clear that X person did this. Is, is, it goes to the act of, of omission of that person that this happened. And, uh, uh, and this uh, is wider because no, it's not necessarily criminal, but accountability brings back to everybody. Everybody is accountable if uh, the, the uh, system goes in a, the ecosystem and the environment goes in a different, in the wrong direction. Everybody is accountable because there are even small acts of any person that may be respectful of the environment or not. And we can make lists, uh, uh, not necessarily we criminalize all of them. Not of them are ecocide in, uh, in a clear term, but all of that contribute to a certain, to, to a certain uh, deterioration of the environment. So accountability is a larger notion that uh, is not necessarily criminal or civil uh, responsibility. Thank you very much, Fausto. Thank you also for uh, alluding to the corporal, corporate social responsibility issue and, and all these uh, business law and human rights and the environment, which is also important. Uh, I, that was exactly my, my next point in a way, uh, um, criminal liability, for uh, corporations, which is covered, of course, by the ELI project and, and by the EU uh, uh, project directive, means also to tackle the mens rea for corporations and, uh, and to have a criminal liability uh, in a, a, a member state's uh, regime uh, system. And therefore, I, I'm, my question is how, how this can be implemented and have some homogeneity, some coherence within the EU, when on the one hand you have uh, to, to, to have evidence of mens rea of a comparison, and at the same time, you, you might have different legal systems. So, uh, I, and I wanted to ask maybe the, the question either to, uh, to uh, Peter Schonka or to Arnaud uh, Nussbaumer, because I know that in Switzerland, uh, we have now new cases uh, in, in front of the uh, Zug court, uh, the canton of Zug, on exactly these points. And maybe here we might have some, uh, some further points that come up. But maybe let's begin with Peter and then maybe Arnaud, and then we will come back to the two reporters for final words. Thank you very much, Pascal. We don't have uh, a... Uh, a, a European harmonization of criminal liability of legal persons. Mm -hmm. um, in the EU, we still have member states which uh, don't know this notion of uh, uh, criminal liability of legal persons. Uh, so our directives for 20 years allow for different systems to coexist. Uh, uh, so in some member states, societas delinquere non potest, uh, still. Uh, they, they have no anima, uh, so they, they cannot uh, commit offenses in the same way as natural persons can. But what we do is to uh, allow them uh, to have uh, the same systems uh, on equal footing uh, so as to ensure that we have uh, um, a level playing field. Uh, therefore, the sanctions can be implemented uh, uh, through any branch of law, provided that they are proportionate, uh, uh, dissuasive and effective. Uh, and then there are methods of calculating uh, sanctions, uh, including uh, the method of uh, using the worldwide turnover, uh, and that works fine. Uh, and these uh, sanctions are more or less uh, recognized among uh, the member states. Uh, uh, we do see problems uh, with this, uh, but so far the EU was unable uh, to introduce uh, a uniform uh, principle of criminal liability of legal persons. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Arnaud, do you want to uh, react, please? Yeah, thank you, Pascal. Um, uh, in Switzerland, we see the liability on legal persons as, as a subsidiary responsibility. You put the criminal responsibility on the legal person when you cannot find anyone within the legal entity who is more responsible than the legal entity. And, and I, I think that's why this Article 8 of the, the proposal is remarkable, because you can suddenly see uh, the legal entity as the primary responsible person, which is in a way um, more closer to, to what actually happens within a corporation. I, th I think it's, it's more accurate, I think, to, to blame the corporation as a whole than one or two person that would have maybe done something wrong. Um, and and to, to, to make a, a link with what's going on right now, uh, so four Indonesian uh, citizens have filed uh, a civil claim against uh, Lafarge Olsim in, uh, in Sug, um, claiming that uh, Olsim is responsible for uh, the, 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 the le raising level of the sea, so uh, harming their harvest. Um, and, and I think that um, with an Article 8 included within um, the Swiss legal system, their, their case would be, would be stronger uh, because suddenly we quite easily with the criminal uh, route, we, we would have um, um, a legal entity primary responsible, we, which would probably allow some um, some some good result for for them. So I think it's a it's a very interesting point that you that you raise here. Thank you very much. Giorgio wanted to to react also very quickly, and so you you have also uh, the uh, room for a quick answer, and then I will go back to Fausto and and Robert. Thank you. Yes, just a brief thought about the individual versus corporate um, liability and responsibility. Um, I, I think while what Arno said is, is absolutely probably accurate in terms of, you know, it's the corporation that, that sort of creates the harm, if you like. At the same time, the, the whole the deterrence factor is massively um, enhanced with the criminal liability of individual persons. And particularly when it comes to um, to ecocide, you know, it, a company where one of their key C-suite executives is having a tap on the shoulder about a possible criminal case, that is not only going to massively affect their own reputation, threaten their personal freedom, etc., but it's also going to immediately affect the stock value of the company. And so what that means is that the deterrence aspect that comes with individual criminal liability is, is actually hugely, hugely important in this case. And then one very brief moment on um, climate cases. Um, I think it's I think it's true that climate cases will prove more difficult to take. But I think also having in conversations that we've had with lawyers and prosecutors who are actually eager to get their teeth into actually doing side cases, initial cases would be likely to be quite clear cut cases, probably more in the direct pollution arena because of course the the the, the, the there'll be a wish to build up clear you know case case law and jurisprudence and so on, perhaps before tackling some of the more um, ambiguous or, or, or difficult to define climate cases. That, that's our impression from conversations we've had at any rate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe I can give the floor to, to Robert and then Fausto uh, for, for final comments or, or reactions to what has been uh, said today. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pascal. I would like to thank everybody for their, for their contributions. It's been a very good, very good webinar. Um, just a few things um, as far as corporate liability is concerned. Well, Eli has got its project coming up, which should come up with some interesting questions, if not answers. And with Ecoside, yes, I agree with the deterrent point, but I also agree with the point that as Ecoside is a, is a crime of consequences, it's very difficult to pin it down to one or two or three individuals. It's a whole group. It's It's the actual cooperation which add or to which the mens rea can be infer, imputed I think so it's 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 a very interesting question as far as climate change is concerned I agree with Churchill that I think our definition would cover climate change we we were loath to go down that avenue because we knew or we felt that there would be a lot of resistance to it you know there's still a lot of a lot of people that deny that climate change is going on, even though it absolutely obviously is. Um, 
And lastly, the question of NGOs and the EP EPPO. I think the EPPO would be the ideal body to take up and prosecute and investigate these cases. Of course, Peter Sonko is right. They need the expertise. They would need to change their rules of procedure. They would need to change their recruitment procedures as well. They would have to have special competitions, training courses, but where else to do it? It would be, it would be a wonderful thing, I think. EPO, EPPO has, is, is, seems to be a success. I think that everybody that I speak to thinks that it, it's been a wonderful thing. Um, so change their rules of procedure. You can do lots and lots of things without having to adopt primary legislation. Uh, and the last thing, of course, is, uh, you know, what, an example of what I think is ecocide is actually mentioned in recital or seven, I think it is, of our directive, which is the terrible pollution of the rivers, lakes and seas in the United Kingdom, which is going on with, um, well, authorised by, by companies, many of whose shareholders are in Europe. And as the government is saying that this is unlikely to be dealt with for at least 25 years, by that time, the damage done to the watercourses, some of the most beautiful watercourses in the world, the chalk streams in uh, southern England, will be destroyed completely, and the and the eco and, and their biospheres, biospheres, everything will be gone forever. And if this is not ecocide, or potentially ecocide, I don't know what it is. And if there were a possibility of prosecuting these people, the directors of those companies who are paid a king's ransom, yeah. If they had to face, face the fact that they might have to be standing on the dock in the Old Bailey in London, they might change their views. But still, anyway, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, Fausto, do you want to add uh, a couple of words? Uh, very shortly, just. Uh... Just to have um, the last word, is just to, to say that uh, um, I'm very happy of this discussion because uh, it shows uh, that uh, our project, uh, our report, has uh, uh, really become known and uh, is really participating in the debate on, on ecocide, which is, was the purpose, actually, the essential purpose was that. Then, on the solutions, we will see what the solution will be achieved. Then we will have on a point a better solution, another point a better solution on the other side. But what is important is this, uh, that this question remains on the agenda and becomes even more, more, more on the agenda because it's essential for uh, our, for the future generations. I mean, not only ours, I'm an old man, it doesn't matter, but for future generation, this is extremely important. It is our responsibility and accountability. This is a real problem of accountability, I think. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fausto. And uh, it's my turn now to thank you all, and especially first uh, the two co-reporters for, for this excellent uh, uh, project, but also for the time they invested in this project, also in trying to make it known early enough so that it ha might have an impact on the discussions going on at the EU level in particular, but I'm sure that this will also have an impact on other institutions like the uh, Council of Europe. We have heard things are going on there too and in other areas. But I'd like also to thank very much the panelists all of you who uh, really took the time on your uh, lunch break, so hopefully you will be able to eat something at some point, to, uh, to give us insight, a better insight on where we are right now, where we will be in a couple of, uh, of months uh, after this trilogue, and also uh, you know, to, to reflect together with the uh, uh, people who uh, attended this uh, webinar on uh, where to go with this project and with Ecoside in general. So thank you very much. I wish you all a very good day uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, the uh, further discussion. Thank you. <laughs>